Okay, welcome to lecture four of CS159, uh, Data-Driven Algorithm Design. In this lecture, we'll be talking about learning for discrete optimization, uh, mostly about learning to search. So uh, what is discrete optimization? Well, it, at a high level, discrete optimization is any optimization problem over a discrete space. So on the left, you see a planning problem where it's a little bit hard to see, but there's an obstacle in front of the rover in this particular scenario. And the rover needs to decide if it's going to go left or right of this obstacle. <clears throat> and that's a discrete decision. You can't really go sort of in, into the obstacle, right? So there's no way to sort of continuously uh, map out this action space that allows you to go in between the obstacles. So if you represent this obstacle as going left or right of it, that's a discrete or binary choice with nothing in between. In the middle, we have a board game, uh, Go. And in, in board games, you have to make a discrete choice of what your next move is. You can't really you know, uh, model this as a continuous action space because you know, the, the, the actual game moves are very discrete. And so they, they're not continuous nor differentiable. You have classical optimization in this case, um, or excuse me, classical combinatorial optimization. In this case, it's a traveling salesperson. And again, you, you have to commit to a path that is a tour over the um, vertices in this graph. And that is a discrete choice. There's no continuous space of paths. There's only discrete space of paths and you have to make a very discrete jump from one action to the next. And then just the fourth example, and of course there are many others that I'm not describing, is a memory controller. If your, um, if your RAM um, is, or, or cache, let's say, is out of memory, is full, and your, your program requests another piece of memory, you have to evict something from your cache. And so a typical scheduler uh, chooses one of the uh, locations in the cache to evict, and that is, again, a discrete choice. And, and of course, people have thought about using learning algorithms to learn a better, better memory controller. So those, those are just examples of discrete optimization problems. And unlike the, the stuff we looked at in the previous lecture, which were continuous, with, with a continuous set of solutions, everything here is discrete, and you have to do a big jump from one to the other at least as a function of maybe parameters of a learning problem. So uh, there are many basic approaches. This is not an exhaustive list. We're gonna go over a few of the things on this slide in this lecture. We're gonna talk about ways of formulating discrete optimization problems. We're gonna talk about you know, different concepts like what partial solutions and algorithms that iteratively build up a partial solution to a full solution. And then there are algorithms that actually um, start with a full solution. Somehow you, you're initialized with a full solution and then you basically locally modify your full solution to get better full solutions. And then there are other algorithms, other approaches that combine multiple algorithms in different phases, uh, like, uh, um, like, like a first applying a pre-solve and then applying a different solver. And we're not, we're not gonna go over all of the things in this slide um, in this lecture. We'll, we'll touch on some more in depth in some special topic. Uh, discussion lectures in later on in the course, but we'll go over a few of these in, in enough depth so you get a sense of how these approaches work. So first, let me talk about what a partial solution even means. So as an example, uh, let me use minimum vertex cover, which is, very which is a very classic combinatorial optimization problem that you learn about, I, I believe, in CS38 here at Caltech. Um, in minimum vertex cover, you are given a graph which is specified by vertices and edges. You see an example on the right with uh, five vertices and five edges. The vertices are numbered one through five. And the goal is to select a subset of the vertices uh, that cover as many of the edges as possible. Oh, sorry, that covers all the edges. Um, Minimum vertex cover is the problem that selects the minimum set of, set of vertices that covers all the edges. So for example, a full solution would be to select the vertice, would select the set of vertices one, three, and four, because those are adjacent to all the edges in this graph. A partial solution is to select a set uh, one and three, which does not cover the edge between vertices four and five. And the minimum 
full solution or the optimal full solution is one that is the smallest possible. So in this particular simple example, uh, the smallest possible size is three. So one, three, four is an optimal solution. And so you can imagine algorithms that start with a full solution and then do local uh, updates, like switching up pieces of full solutions from another piece to get a different full solution. And you could also imagine algorithms that iteratively build up a partial solution to, until it reaches a full solution. And so that's what I mean when I say partial solution. Um, they're also known as complete versus incomplete settings or optimal versus non-optimal settings. And those are the case, those happen in cases where there are multiple solutions, but one of them or, or a subset of them are quote unquote best under some cost metric, such as size of the solution. And so a complete algorithm is one that in these settings, a complete algorithm is one that finds the best solution and one it typically measures how much time until finding it. Incomplete approaches typically are framed as, given a time budget, find the best solution possible. Uh, so that's just a, a note about, uh, another way of thinking about um, how to quantify how, how well your algorithm is doing. If you really wanna find the best solution, then, and then there are applications where anything less than the best solution is not good enough. And there are other applications that are time sensitive. Like if I'm, if I'm uh, NASA and I'm piloting and I'm, I wanna do auto navigation of the Mars rover, I don't wanna spend forever figuring out a plan because then I'm just sitting there waiting around to until I um, execute it. So given a budget of you know, one minute or 30 seconds, find the best plan possible and then just execute it. Okay, so let's start with talking about sort of a, a more generic or black box approach and um, using that to sort of talk about the greedy algorithm or also known as best first search. Um, so uh, the generic black box formulation is very basic. Um, in, in its simplest form, it has, it has almost nothing to it. So in its simplest form, this is it in the first bullet point where uh, we want to find and this. I'm going to frame this as a minimization problem. You could also frame it as a maximization problem and it doesn't really matter. We have a discrete set, often combinatorially large. So that's what capital X is. F of X is the cost function. And we want to find an X and F of X that minimizes, um, we want to find X that minimizes F of X. This is the simplest form. You can put more structure to it. Um, and if we have no other information, then this is just black box optimization. So just, just to be clear that this is sort of the, where we're starting from. We typically have more information, but this is where we're starting from. So how do we solve this? Um, so scenario one, um, again, you could frame this as either a minimization or a maximization problem as a cost function or a reward function. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm probably gonna switch off between referring to F as a reward function or, a optim, uh, or a cost function, depending on the application. Um, so for example, in, um, in, in a board game like Go, um, at least a, at least a deterministic board game, F, perhaps we can use F of X to model or actually directly quantify whether or not uh, a move you make is going to be a winning move or not a losing move. Now. Uh, that objective function is very sparse because you don't know if you're going to have a winning move or, uh, or a losing move until you actually roll out a game. Um, and that is really, really expensive. And, and, and you can't actually measure it locally. So that's what I mean by sparse. Um, and so in lieu of uh, using uh, the true objective function, F, uh, we, people use surrogates, right? So people say, well, the true objective function is whether or not you win or lose the game, and that's really too sparse um, in, in, within this action space or state space. And we're gonna define surrogates. And surrogates can be anything like points for achieving uh, certain piece formations, uh, points for capturing the opponent's pieces, points for you know, some compute, a probability of winning the game, and perhaps that's something that we can estimate from data. So these are all very dense objective functions that you can measure, these surrogate measures. And then you can make these local updates that um, you know, greedily maximize or, or 
optimize this objective. Um, so, you know, given this dense surrogate, we can use a st more standard search algorithm, such as greedy. That's the basic idea. So that leads us to greet the greedy algorithm, best first search. And here again, I'm, I'm framing it as a minimization problem. You could do maximization, doesn't really matter. And the algorithm is very simple. If, if we have a surrogate measure, and I'll just call it F for simplicity, um, then we greedily um, grow a partial solution um, that you know, in one step has the best um, uh, improvement in our surrogate measure. So if this is our algorithm, the greedy algorithm. It's, it's the simplest algorithm you could possibly think of. Then the question is, okay, we're gonna to commit to this as our algorithm. There's a big piece in this algorithm that's typically designed by hand, and that's the surrogate measure. Can we learn a good surrogate measure such that the greedy algorithm performs very well? So that's sort of the question. And that's the first place that we'll look at the intersection between learning and discrete algorithms. Any questions so far? Okay. So um, I'm just gonna sort of go over something pretty quick. The greedy algorithm is, as you can imagine, it, it's super simple. It is exactly what it, what it sounds like. There's nothing mysterious about it. And so there's basically two things um, that goes into um, learning a good surrogate for a greedy algorithm. The first one is what is your function class? Well, uh, of that, you know, what is it represent that you use to actually learn to estimate a good F, a surrogate function? And the second one is, you know, what is your training data? So let me talk about the first one first uh, in the context of this particular paper. Um, and uh, for many uh, optimization problems, uh, they can be expressed as graphs. So for example, minimum vertex cover is a graph optimization problem. It, it, it's expressed as some operation over a graph. And so one uh, model class that has become very popular or, or increasingly popular in the last few years is a graph neural network or a graph convolutional neural network that operates over graphs. So a, a standard convolutional neural network operates over uh, a square image, which you can think of as just a, um, a regular grid graph. And you can think of graph neural networks in general as some um, generalization of convolutional neural networks, or at least graph convolutional neural networks are generalizations of graph neural networks that look at graph structures that are not regular grid graphs. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into details um, of graph neural networks, but the, but you know, the basic idea is we take a graph, we, we, we use a graph neural network to map it to an embedding, just like how convolutional neural networks ultimately map pixels or grid, a grid of pixels to some embedding. And then from that embedding, we can predict, you know, what is the best node to add. And so now the question is, well, what is the reward function? Well, in the simplest case, what you can do is reinforcement learning, which is a sampling based approach that actually, that actually, um, you know, samples a bunch of actions and measures the final reward and then uses that to learn a good a surrogate of local actions that might lead to good high final rewards. And so I just, um, I just copy and pasted the pseudocode from this paper. It's pretty simple. So we can just walk through it really quickly. This, this particular reinforcement learning algorithm is called Q-learning. It's one of the simplest ones that you can do. Um, and so uh, this is a uh, stochastic optimization problem. So in step three, we notice that there's a distribution of problem instances and we sample one problem instance from the distribution. So in that sense, it's stochastic. And then steps of uh, step six, uh, so, excuse me, step five is the iteration. So, so capital T is the number of iterations of this, of this greedy algorithm. So we're gonna run the greedy algorithm for capital T iterations. Step six is the, the, the sampling part. So you notice that in step six, uh, the first clause says we sample a random node in the their notation is V vertex uh, to add to the partial solution. 
Uh, and that's the sampling part. So basically what Q-learning does in step six is with probability epsilon, try something random. Try a random vertex to add to, add to the solution. With probability one minus epsilon, try the thing that we think is best so far. That's the second clause. That's step six. And so um, this is how we collect training data because we want to be able to measure the true solution, uh, the true the true function, and we do and but we can't do that. If we don't collect data, and so step six, the the random sampling is how we collect data. And then basically in step seven, we commit to this vertex as, as the next thing in the partial solution. And then in steps nine through 11 is basically how you estimate, uh, uh, learn the reward, uh, the surrogate reward function um, from measuring how well you're doing on the actual problem. So I know I went over that a little fast. And for those of you who are not familiar with reinforcement learning, you, know, you probably didn't get every step, but this is a pretty basic algorithm and it's basically saying with, we're going to randomly sample uh, different solutions just to collect the data, and we will then measure how well we're doing, add that to, use that to train a surrogate, and then repeat this process. That's the basic idea. And that's the basic idea of reinforcement learning in general. Some, some approaches are more efficient than others. Q-learning is a pretty simple idea. And the surrogate function, the way, reason was that why it's called Q-learning is that the surrogate function, if you will, is represented as a Q function. Any questions about that? Okay. And so here are some empirical results from the paper. Um, they looked at three uh, different uh, graph optimization pro problems, minimum vertex cover, max cut, and traveling salesperson. Uh, these are different combinatorial optimization problems defined over graphs. And uh, you see that um, uh, their approach, which is in blue, um, you know, tends to perform very well compared to you know, uh, other approaches that uh, don't apply learning or, um, to, to do this approach. So one of the nice things about this approach is that Training time is very expensive because you're, you're doing random sampling. But if you can train well, you've basically learned a surrogate function such that uh, greedy algorithm works well. And the greedy algorithm is the simplest algorithm you can run. So at test time, this approach is lightning fast. At test time, this approach is lightning fast because you're just doing this one pass greedy. And, and I'll touch on this uh, again um, in later on in this lecture. Okay, scenario two, which is related to scenario one, but slightly different. Um, the true objective function is too expensive to measure. So one common scenario where this happens is that querying f of x requires running a simulator which can be very expensive. So you want, so, you know, even though um, if you can query f of x, the algorithm is in principle very simple. Um, the fact that you have to query f of x makes the algorithm very expensive at, at runtime. Oops. And so another thing you can do, which is very related to the previous idea, is, well, we're going to learn a surrogate to predict the objective. Um, and in doing so, then you know we can use that as a as a replacement for the greedy algorithm. So again, we're we're learning a surrogate such that the greedy algorithm perform, uh, works well using the surrogate, rather than random sampling uh, of a to to learn a smooth surrogate, learn a dense surrogate over a over a sparse true objective function. Here, the objective function might be dense in the action space, um, but but it. But just evaluating the objective function is expensive. So we're going to learn a surrogate to predict the value of the objective function and use that for, for the greedy algorithm. Um, so again, at training time, we query the simulator many, many times. This can be very expensive. And then because we have a dense objective function, we're going to apply imitation learning or supervised learning to uh, to fit the surrogate to the objective and and help uh, and do that to identify the best greedy decision using the surrogate, 
And there are ways of doing this that are smarter than others. Uh, so we can do smarter querying. Um, and uh, I won't go into the details in this particular lecture. I actually touched on this problem a bit in lecture five next Tuesday about, you know, if you have a good uh, uh, objective function that you want to train a surrogate for um, because it's faster at runtime for whatever reason, how do you query it more intelligently? So I'll talk about this in, more, in greater detail in lecture five. But for now, suppose that there's a method for doing this. Then, uh, excuse me, let me hide that for a second. Then you can um, basically, at test time, plug in this surrogate um, for the, uh, a, a, into the greedy algorithm. And so what you see on the bottom left is an application that um, I actually uh, collaborated on uh, several years ago, where you have the simulator of trying to figure out how to um, pick a, a trajectory for a robotic arm that successfully reaches the target while avoiding obstacles and not colliding with anything. And the approach is called STP. It's the thing in red on the bottom, uh, on the bottom right. And what you see here is a comparison between SCP and two uh, less, uh, more naive uh, learning algorithms that doesn't that doesn't do smart smart querying of the simulator at training time, and you see that um, by being more more intelligent about how we query the simulator, we can do better. So because this is a dense in, dense in, dense uh, measure, um, and all the approaches do 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 okay because um, you know the 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 reward function or signal is dense in the action space. It's just expensive to evaluate. So if you do random sampling, you fit a function to that, which is what the green line is. That's what regression is. You just you just randomly query the simulator at training time, and then just fit a regression function and use that as a surrogate for the greedy algorithm at test time. You still do okay because everything's everything is uh, is dense in the action space. But if you're more intelligent about how you query the reward function uh, and the simulator, uh, you can do better. So that's the basic idea. And I'll touch on this a little bit more in terms of the actual sort of the, the, the technical uh, issue that arises here in lecture five next, uh, next Tuesday in a more abstract way. Um, not specific, this particular problem is not specific to this particular application. Any questions about that? Okay, so just to summarize, the simplest thing we can do is we commit to the greedy algorithm as the algorithm structure. The greedy algorithm is very simple. If you have a good, if you have a good surrogate function, then you just greedily, you just greedily um, grow a partial solution that maximally optimizes this surrogate function. And the goal then is to use machine learning to learn a surrogate function such that the greedy algorithm performs well. And you saw two examples um, using both either uh, reinforcement learning where, you, where the reward function is sparse in the action space and you, you have to do sample, you have to do sample based um, optimization to learn a surrogate function and imitation learning where you have a surrogate, where you have a, a measurement that is, um, that is dense in the action space but is expensive so you don't want to query it at, at, at runtime and you want to learn a function to imitate this dense but expensive to query reward function. I'm going to move on to a star search. So the greedy algorithm in general is not optimal. You, if you're, if you're lucky, you can find, you, perhaps you can learn a surrogate function that is so good that the greedy algorithm basically behaves optimally. But this is putting a lot of pressure on learning a good surrogate function. And in some cases, that can just be too hard. In particular, the greedy algorithm quits after finding any solution, and it doesn't do any kind of backtracking. It just, it just, it just keeps, greedy basically means I just keep committing to whatever I've found so far, and I don't ever look backwards. That's, that's what greedy means. So um, what are algorithm structures that are guaranteed to return optimal solutions? So the greedy algorithm is an algorithmic structure. It's the simplest one. Let's look at some that are more complicated and are guaranteed to return the optimal solution. So again, we're gonna stick with a graph-based representation for this part of the lecture. So 
Um, the goal is to find the optimal path from an initial state or a node or vertex to a goal state. And suboptimal paths, so paths that are maybe too long, uh, correspond to suboptimal solutions. And partial solutions are paths that do not connect the initial state to the goal state. And state-to-state -state transitions in this graph representation indicate the allowable local modifications of partial solutions. So if you want to grow a partial solution, you, uh, the state-to-state -state transitions, the edges in this graph, if you will, uh, are the allowable uh, local modifications to grow partial solutions. Um, so um, one idea is to do um, this thing called breadth first search, which basically expands a horizon. And I believe this is a video, it should play. Yeah, I'm gonna play this video. So the, the, the uh, start state is the star and the goal state is the cross. And the greedy algorithm just greedily picks the, picks the next uh, edge uh, that it gets to the, that gets you closest to the, um, to the goal state. And the breadth first search expands everything on the frontier of things that might reach the goal state. And here, this is a grid world graph. So uh, everything's on a 2D grid and the edges are basically the, adjacent, the, the vertical and horizontal neighbors. So I'm gonna play this. So the grid algorithm basically uh, finished very quickly. Oops. The grid algorithm finished extremely quickly. It's almost too fast to see in the animation whereas the breadth first search algorithm explored the entire frontier. That's what the shaded region looks like. Uh, if you're interested, uh, by the way, these slides are on, on, uh, online and you can click on the link below to actually play around with this uh, animation yourself. Let's try something harder. So in the, in the first case, greedy algorithm actually found the optimal paths because the, the, the problem was basically trivial. Let's find something, let's look at something where um, the greedy algorithm will not find the optimal solution, even though it's so fast. So here speed is measured by the number of uh, vertices visited before, um, before finding a solution. So the vertices visited are the shaded blocks in the slightly darker tan color, and the vertices non-visited are the lighter tan color. And the frontier is the thing on the, uh, on, in blue, which are the potential next uh, states to add. So I'm gonna play this one. So you notice that the greedy algorithm for basically, because it doesn't do any backtracking, it basically tries to go towards the, um, towards the goal state, but then you know, after it reaches this obstacle, it just basically hugs this obstacle to reach the goal state. And if you commit to this as the solution, you know, it's a, it's a suboptimal solution. Whereas breadth first search is able to um, is able to find the optimal solution, but you notice that it searched more of the state space. In this particular case, it searched the entire state space. So this is an example where the lack of backtracking will hurt you because you just commit to the first solution you find, the first full solution you find, and the first full solution is not the optimal full solution. So breadth first search, here's how the algorithm works. You maintain what's called a FIFO queue, which is first in, first out. Um, and uh, what a FIFO queue does is it basically says, I have, a, I have this queue of states and uh, I have the head of the queue at the end of, or the front of the queue and the back of the queue. Sometimes, sometimes people call it the head and the tail of the queue or the front or the back. And so I always add things to the back of the queue and I always take the first thing at the front of the queue. So I initialize the queue with just the starting state. That's step one. And then in steps, step two, uh, I, init I remove a state at the front of the queue. So in the, in the beginning, that's just, just the start state. I add all the unvisited adjacent states to the back of the queue, uh, which in this case are all the adjacent states to the start state. And then I repeat from step two until I reach a goal state. Um, and in the simplest case, um, 
where all the uh, transitions are unit cost. So this is, this is the simplest case where all the transitions are unit cost. We will eventually find the best solution. So this, is, this algorithm is a guarantee to find the optimal solution. Um, but it is not very efficient. You saw in the previous animation, I know it was a little bit hard to see because of the lag on Zoom, but you can again play with it yourself, that it searches a massive fraction of the state space before committing to the solution. And that's very inefficient. And if the state space was combinatorially large, in the examples that you saw in the previous slides, the state space uh, is not combinatorial large because it's a grid world, but in general, the state space can be, can be massive. The breadth first search can take a long time before it finds the solution. And that's one, one reason why people often prefer greedy, but then greedy is not optimal. Any questions so far? Okay, so this leads us to A star search. Uh, it, is op it is also optimal under certain conditions. Um, and it, it is in practice typically much more efficient than, than breadth first search. So uh, let little x here denote uh, the current state or the current vertex uh, or partial solution that we're on. Um, and then we have, a, we have this estimated cost or surrogate cost at every state. So for every, uh, every partial solution, which is, the, which is uh, the sum of G of X plus H of X. G of X is something we can directly measure. It's the travel cost from the start state to X. So you can just sum that up over the edges that we've, we've traversed to get to X. And the, the new thing here is H of X which is a heuristic cost that we estimate that it predicts how much cost will incur to go from X to the goal state. Uh, and now again, we'll maintain a priority queue. We'll maintain a queue just like in breadth first search, but this would be a priority queue. And a priority queue is not first in first out. A priority queue is sorted in this case by F of X. So the, the, the the, the, the X that has the smallest F of X gets put to the front of the queue. The X that has the largest F of X gets put to the back of the queue. And so the algorithm otherwise behaves a lot like breadth first search. We choose the thing at the head of the priority queue. Uh, in this case, it's not first in first out, but you know, just the priority queue. And then we, um, we add we look at all the neighbors of this state, so all the things that we can expand the state to, the reachable states, if you will. We add that to the queue, we evaluate its f of x for all those neighboring states, and we resort the priority queue, and then we repeat this process. So this looks a lot like breadth first search. We just have this f of x surrogate to, you, to use to sort the priority queue by. So the game that we the, the game that matters here is H. So it turns out that if H was zero, if H was always zero, so we just ignore it, then this algorithm reduces to breadth first search in the case where the, the travel costs are unit costs. This algorithm reduces to breadth first search. Um, so the game that we're playing is finding a good H. Of course, we don't know H in general, or we don't know the best H in general because that requires actually solving the problem. So people use a heuristic that's, uh, people wanna use heuristics that are called admissible. And that's in the second bullet point. An admissible heuristic is a heuristic that uh, under approximates the true cost to the goal. So zero <laughs> is an under approximation. So if H of X is always zero, um, that is an admissible heuristic. And that's why breadth first search um, is a special case of A star search. But in general, we can more, be more intelligent. We can have a smarter H as long as it's still an under approximation of the true optimal. So examples in grid world include straight distance and Manhattan distance. The straight distance is just the straight line distance from the, from the current uh, node to the end node. So here we're just doing start start state to end state. So that's the orange line. And Manhattan distance is well, you know, in this particular uh, representation, we could only make a horizontal and vertical 
expansions of the current state. So the Manhattan distance is like the green line. And that's the, and so both of these uh, distances ignore the fact that there are obstacles. So the true optimal cost in purple, um, you know, is going to be larger than either the green line or the um, orange line, uh, which ignore the, which completely ignore obstacles. So these are both admissible heuristics. So A star search is guaranteed to be optimal if H is admissible. So breadth first search, which is a special case where H of X is always zero, um, is, the, is optimal. And the intuition is that as long as, is the intuition is that H of X is optimistic. We're always optimistic about how good the solution is. Um, the, 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 the way that these algorithms work, the way that ASR search works is that if it thinks this solution is too, too expensive, like it, it thinks that the distance from X to the target state or the goal state is too expensive, it'll basically prune that away. It'll never, that, that's, that state will never reach the head of the priority queue. So it's effectively pruned. And so if, if H of X is admissible, then we will never prune the optimal solution. That's the basic intuition. We can make this more formal, and, uh, but I won't go into the formal uh, proof, but the, this is the key intuition that basically drives the proof. The problem with the greedy algorithm is that you're basically, you, you, because it never backtracks, um, you know, you're always, uh, the thing at the, the, you're always just looking at the state that you were most recently at. It can very easily prune the optimal solution. And you can prove that if H of X is an admissible heuristic that is optimistic and under approximates the true cost, you will never do that. It's a relatively simple proof, um, but you know, I think this intuition uh, basically convey it, it is conveys like 90% of the insights and the formal proof of just you know crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And the other thing to notice um, is that the tighter the approximation, the closer that H of X is, is to H star of X, the true optimal cost, the more efficient A star is. Um, uh, in, in particular, if H of X equals H star of X, um, then um, you, in some cases, you get back the dexterous shortest path algorithm. And so here we see that, you know, if H of X is always zero, then, you know, you get this really loose approximation and A star, is, A star reduces the breadth for a search and it's extremely inefficient. And so here's a, here's a short video. This might be a little bit hard to see over Zoom, but again, you can click on the link to view as well. So you see that A star search in this case, uh, this is using the Manhattan distance as the admissible heuristic from the start, from any state to the goal state. You see that A star search finds the optimal solution like Bradford search. It's less efficient than greedy, but it is way more efficient than Bradford search. And this is, this issue is exacerbated. The difference between A star search and breadth first search is exacerbated in higher dimensional optimization problems. Here, the optimization problem is not combinatorial at large. Any questions? Okay, so. H of X, this heuristic, can be uh, hard to specify by hand. Can we learn it? So that's, that's the, that's the, the, now we're gonna transition from the structure of the discrete algorithm to where we can inject learning so that this discrete algorithm makes better decisions. And so imitation learning for A star search. So this is work by uh, one of the TAs in the class, Jia Lin. Um, and there are other people who have uh, done this as well. I'm just gonna present um, some results that Jalen has worked on. Um, you can uh, also look at other people's work as well. Um, and the key ideas are, are as follows. Um, we run a less efficient optimal solver on training instances. So for example, we can use the Manhattan distance. The A star search with Manhattan distance, at least on grid world it problems, is optimal, it's just not efficient. But once you can run an optimal solver on the training instances, you get this 
optimal solution. So you can train a you can train a, this heuristic such that such that local decisions in A star search are optimal. And again, you can do this you can do this by doing some smart querying of the solver. Uh, so this is the same as the previous uh, problem issue with greedy that you know you can either you can query the solver in a in a smart way or in a naive way, uh, which can lead to different types of learning approaches. And by and if you query the the solver more intelligently, then you can get more efficient learning or more effective learning. And so um, you see this in the um, in the diagram figure on the left. Uh, again, this is just a simple uh, maze problem. Um, so the heuristic is basically Manhattan distance getting from the, um, I believe this is from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. Um, uh, and then a more naive imitation learning algorithm uh, that learns this admissible heuristic um, uh, is the middle one. So the orange region is, oh, sorry, the yellow region is the region that is, that's explored. So the smaller the yellow region, the more efficient the algorithm is. And then a smarter imitation learning approach that does more smarter querying of the solver, um, you can get uh, a little bit better in this, in this simple example. And then on the, um, on the figure on the right, you just see a, um, and a, a, a quantitative measurement. So the, the, the smart approach is, um, is uh, the blue line that Jialin worked on. The heuristic, such as Manhattan distance, is the purple line. And then in this particular case, uh, we're also showing um, reinforcement learning, which is the which is the green line. And you can see that reinforcement learning doesn't do very well. I think if we ran the reinforcement learning algorithm for longer at training, it could probably do better, but it just it was just taking forever in this particular experiment. So the key idea here is that you know this is actually very similar to the greedy algorithm. In the greedy algorithm, where you're learning this surrogate function, um, and such that the greedy algorithm performs well. Here in A star search, the the the, the, the discrete optimization algorithm has a little bit more structure because you have this you have this g and the h, and the g is typically specified. It's easy to specify in any particular domain. It's the h that is hard to specify. You can people have often handcrafted h's. For various domains, and the idea here is that we want to learn this H such that A star search is as efficient as possible. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to move on to integer programs and branch and bound. So an integer program, uh, and, and we'll restrict ourselves in this in this lecture and probably for the for the class to what's called mixed integer linear programs or MILPs. Um, uh, here the formulation again is, is slightly different. So all, it's hard, it, was, it, it was a little challenging to unify the, the notation in this lecture because the, all, all the problems typically use very different notations. So, uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, this lecture uses uh, inconsistent notation throughout the lecture because different problem definitions typically use a very different notation. It was hard to unify. Um, in this particular problem, um, we have a set of var variables, integer variables, x. Um, they take on discrete values. And then you have a, a linear objective function over these variables. And then you have um, linear constraints, um, and so uh, you can. And this is a very expressive uh, way of way of writing uh, writing out a discrete optimization problem. So you see an example on the right. We've seen this example before in lecture one. Well, let's just revisit it. Um, uh, this is uh, on the left. You just is the is the diagram of a graph, and we want to solve the minimum vertex cover problem on this graph. And um, on the right, you have an integer program uh, formulation that captures this vertex problem. So we want to find 
the we want to find so each x sub i corresponds to one of the five vertices. Um, and it's either zero or one. So that's the, that's the bottom line of the formulation on the bottom right. And so if x of i is zero, that means this, this vertex is not part of the, the solution. If x of i is one, that means this vertex is part of the solution. Um, and the objective function is to find is to find a set a solution set that is as small as possible. And in this particular case, we wrote it as a maximization problem of the negative cost. You could also just write it as a minimization problem of the cost. The cost is just the size of the cover, which is the number of x variables that are one. But you can't just choose any vertex cover. Or you can't just choose any cover. You have to actually cover the vertices. So that's that's where the constraints come in. The constraints say the cons you have one in this particular formulation. You have one constraint per edge in this graph. So you have a constraint on x1, x2, which is the edge connecting x1 and x2, and so on and so forth. And you require that any solution that you that you output from this integer program must cover uh, uh, must cover every edge at least once. And that's what these constraints mean. And these constraints are linear. They're linear operations in the variables, which are the x variables. So this is an integer linear program. And it turns out that integer linear programs can express many, many, many different uh, types of combinatorial optimization problems. Um, and so it's, it's of interest to try to figure out how to solve these integer programs well. And so we're going to be working with this integer program representation rather than the graph representation. So another example uh, that you can express as an integer program uh, is this risk-aware path planning. Uh, I'm not going to write out the full integer program because it's very complicated. Um, the cost is um, some sum over travel cost of um, getting from point A to point B. That's a linear sum. So linear, linear operations are, uh, uh, sums are linear operations. Uh, and then the constraints, you have to play, you have to be a little bit clever about the constraints. You don't want, you want to get, you don't want to get too close to an obstacle. So you can express the constraints in linear form by having this convex uh, polygon uh, that um, encapsulates every obstacle. And that can be expressed as linear constraints. So that's the basic idea. And if you're interested in details, you can uh, click on the link on the bottom left. Um, but that's how you would write, uh, formulate risk-aware path planning with obstacle avoidance uh, as a linear program. So here's the general formulation of a mixed integer linear program. Um, you have variables x. Some of the, x, some of the x's are, um, are are integers, so they're discrete. They cannot take on. They can only take on one of uh, these discrete values. And some of the variables are uh, real value. So that's the that's a, that's the thing you see at the bottom of the description. So z, the the double bar z is the space of integers. Uh, uh, or and the double bar R is a space of reals. <clears throat> and you have a linear constraint, you have a linear objective function and a set of linear constraints. So we're not gonna be working with graph representations anymore. We're gonna be working with this representation. We'll assume that this representation can be used to represent uh, the combinatorial optimization problem or the discrete optimization problem of your of interest. And, and then we'll just be working with this representation for the next um, part of the lecture. Um, again, I'm gonna go over this a little bit quickly and if you've never seen an integer program before, that's okay. Uh, the goal of this lecture is to give you, get you enough intuition, high level intuition about how an integer program works that if you're interested in this area, of course you can follow up uh, on the papers and reference materials in the class. So again, to solve integer programs, just like in A-star search, you know, we want some sort of admissible heuristic for integer programs. So uh, in particular, um, given a partial solution, so a partial solution is where some of the integer variables x's are fixed and some of them are, are not fixed. So we've set some of the integer variables and the other integer variables we haven't set yet. That's what a partial solution is. So given a partial solution, what is an optimistic estimate of the best full solution that completes this partial solution? 
So one way to do this is we treat the free variables as real value. So, so it's the, 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 the X's that the integer, the integer variables X's that have not been set yet, we'll just allow them to be completely real valued. And so all the free variables are now real valued. And that means, and, an integer pro, an, and this is a linear integer program. And so if all the, if all the free variables are, are, treat, are, are treated as real, uh, real value, um, then this becomes a convex optimization problem that is easy to solve. Because the space of real, real numbers is a superset of the space of integers within the, with the same range, then the solution of, the, um, of this real value uh, optimization problem, this linear program, is gonna be at least as good as the solution of the integer program. So this is an admissible heuristic because it's an optimistic estimate of the best completion of the value of the best completion of the partial solution. And so in integer programming, this is typically called the, the linear program relaxation or LP relaxation. So some of the variables are fixed. The ones that are not fixed, we just allow all of them to be real valued. And this is convex. And because it's convex, it's relatively easy to solve. And, it, and because this is a minimization problem, we want to, and the, the objective function is a cost, we want, the, um, we want the, this to be a lower bound on the original cost, which means it's an admissible heuristic. And so um, here's just a simple 2D depiction of an uh, integer program. Um, so, so the cost function, so this is the space of, uh, this is a 2D uh, uh, integer program. Um, the constraints are the, are, the, um, are the boundaries of the shaded region. So you have these constraints, the AX less than or equal to B, and then the constraints on the X. And that specifies this, um, this shaded yellow region and the constraints are the, are the boundaries of this yellow region. Uh, there, it's linear, so this is a so it's a it's a polygon, and then the cost function is the is the is the hyperplane on the on the right hand side, with the arrow corresponds to the to the C cost. So we want to minimize the cost, so we want to move towards the direction of the hyperplane. And so this is just a two D problem. So there's two variables x one and x two. So we could just exhaustively enumerate this if we want to find the in best integer solution. The integer solutions are the are the are the uh, black circles. In general, of course, with many variables, this is ex the number of integer solutions is exponentially large. And you have to do discrete jumps over one or the other. But if we allowed all the integer variables to be real valued, then this becomes a continuous optimization problem that's convex. And so it's relatively easy to solve. And then we can find the solution of the, uh, of the linear LP relaxation where all the variables are, are allowed to be real valued. And that's the red line the red dot. And the value of the red dot is better than the value, is at least as good as the value of any of the black dots because you're optimizing over the entire shaded yellow region rather than just the black dots. So the yellow shaded region is a superset of the black dots. And so it's, the solution is guaranteed to be at least as good as any of the black dots. So the value at that black dot, at, at the red dot, is the admissible heuristic. So uh, let's, see, let's see what happened here. Okay, so we're gonna pick one of the integer variables and we're going to, um, so I'm, I'm now gonna describe the branch and bound uh, algorithm in, uh, in slides, uh, in picture. Um, I'm gonna pick one of the integer variables and I'm gonna set it to, uh, uh, I'm gonna set it to one of two values. And so, by setting the integer uh, program to one of two values, you actually, you, you basically fork the, um, uh, you basically, uh, or you, sorry, let me backtrack slightly, I, I misspoke. I'm gonna pick one of the integer values, variables, and I'm gonna set it to, um, I, I'm gonna set it to say, well, x2 is either greater than um, five or less than five. So x2 is the vertical direction, so, X2, uh, uh, X2 is either greater than or equal to five or less than or equal to four. 
that's 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 what's happening here. And if x2 is greater than or equal to five, then you're in the top shaded region. If x2 is less than or equal to four, we're in the bottom shaded region. And each shaded region, um, you know, forms its own um, forms its own subproblem. And, and again, you can solve the LP relaxation for each of the subproblems, and you get two immiscible heuristics for the subproblems. That's the red, uh, that's the that's the white circle and the red circle. And the red circle is the one that's lower than the in the white circle. So you have two immiscible heuristics. One is um, one is lower than the other, and one is globally uh, the best immiscible heuristic. You keep you continue this process where now we're gonna branch on the um, on x1 in the bottom region. We branch on x1 being less than or equal to six or greater than or equal to seven, and then we solve and then we solve for the optimization problem in the in the continuous yellow regions for both for both of them. And here we see that um, the the one of the solutions of the um, of the of the yellow region is actually an integer value. So the, the blue circle actually it turns out that the solution of that problem is actually all, all the variables have integer values. And so that is an upper bound. So that means we found it we found a solution and any and the optimal solution that's integer valued has to be at least as good as the yellow as the blue line. So this is what this is what branch and bound how branch and bound works. We have an admissible heuristic that gives us the lower bound of the cost. And then as soon as we find any integer valued solution, maybe it may not be the optimal one, but we, as soon as we find any, we have an upper bound on the best solution. And we continue this process until the blue line and the, and the red line matches. And that's when we know that we have found the optimal solution. Because the because the the red line is guaranteed to be admissible, uh, it, it, you can't go lower than it. And if and if the integer solution you found has a value that matches the red line, then it must be optimal. Any questions? Okay, so the LP relaxation gives an admissible heuristic for the best completion of a partial solution, and you use it to prune the search space. Uh, in A star search, we also use this admissible heuristic to select which part of the search space to expand. But actually, in this in the example that I showed here, we're only using this uh, admissible heuristic to uh, prune part of the search space. So in this particular example, you see those uh, crosses with circles. Uh, those are all things that we've pruned because the blue line is above the red line. So maybe it's easier to see here. So the, the cross you see in the bottom right is the best LP like, is the best admissible heuristic for that little shaded yellow region. Let me annotate so you can see more clearly. Um, so this guy right here is the best is the admissible heuristic for the best possible solution under approximation of the best possible solution in this region. Because this value according to this gradient, this, this uh, diagonal black line, this value is higher than the blue value, we can eliminate or prune this from the search solution space because nothing in this region can be better than the blue value because we've computed the admissible heuristic for this region. So like in A star, we use the admissible heuristic to prune large part of the state space. Unlike A star, we need a second decision heuristic to choose which variable to how to branch next. So in this sense, branch and bound is more complicated than A star search because we need because we need this other decision heuristic to choose where, where to branch next. So you know how to make good local decisions. You know there are many uh, approaches. This is a slide I, I showed in the first lecture. Uh, there are many approaches, um, and in general, 
people prefer using imitation learning for this problem. And you know, we, we saw a few examples of using imitation learning in, throughout this lecture. And I want to circle back on this point. So um, reinforcement learning is more general, right? So if you have some objective function you want to measure, and there's always an objective function that you can measure, it just, it just, it just might be super sparse in, the, uh, in, the, in, this, in the state action space, like winning the game, for example. If you want to use a reinforcement learning approach, you basically, you're basically just trying random trajectories or random solutions or uh, sampling them. And then you're through the sampling process, you, you can learn um, a surrogate to predict which approach or which, which uh, states will lead to a high reward solution. So this in some sense is super general and it's, but it can be extremely, extremely expensive to train. In many cases, for these types of problem instances, you are, we already have existing solvers. So we have solvers that work okay. They can find solutions. Sometimes they can find optimal solutions, but they just might be really slow. And imitation learning can learn to mimic the solution of an existing solver. The existing solver is slow, typically because it does a lot of backtracking. Like if you have to backtrack a lot, then, um, you know, you, you're basically encountering a lot of dead ends before you find a solution. And so, you know, imitation learning can improve the performance of the existing solver potentially by learning to avoid the dead ends encountered by the solver. So you can think of the local decisions of the solver as the dense uh, learning signal um, that you can learn to imitate. But reinforcement learning is still needed on problems where the existing solvers cannot even find a solution. So, uh, you know, there are, so even though we've talked a lot about imitation learning in this, in this lecture, and again, um, in lecture five next Tuesday, I'm going to go into a little bit more uh, details about some of the nuances of using imitation learning and reinforcement learning. Um, but reinforcement learning is still needed on problems where the existing solvers cannot find a solution. So here's just a, a, a pictorial example where um, uh, we have an off-the-shelf solver that's you know, doing, this treat, doing this search thing and um, it finds an optimal solution. That's the, red, that's the black star with the red circle around it. Uh, but it's very inefficient. So everything else you see that, that is not a path from the, uh, from the, from the start node to this, to this gold node, everything else are backtracks and dead ends. So if we, if, we, if we somehow didn't need to backtrack at all, we can solve this problem really, really, really quickly. If we needed to backtrack way too much, then, then you know, solving this problem might take exponential time because we, we'll, we'll end up exploring a full, the full combinatorial space of, of, the, of the states. So you know, pruning, using these admissible heuristics for pruning, um, is sort of the name of the game in these different algorithms that are that can find optimal solutions and but try to be as efficient as possible. If if, if you have a good heuristic for for pruning, then you can prune more aggressively, and then you can be more efficient. Uh, but if you can't prune very aggressively, then you're less efficient. So we have these existing solvers. They're okay. They're not great. And at training time, we can on a problem instance, we can run that solver to get something that looks like this. And now after we run the solver, we notice that, well, okay, here are all the dead ends and backtracking that the solver needed to make. Can we use learning to design a heuristic such that we minimize the amount of time we, ex we expand the state space that does, not, that does not lie on that red path? So one thing is, okay, we can do imitation learning where the training signal is at every, at every node in this, in this search tree, um, the red node is preferred over the white node. So we want to learn a heuristic that is rank consistent with the red node being preferred to the white node at every node in the search tree. And that's the training data that we train to us that we give to our solver to learn a better, in this case, branching heuristic for branch and bound.
So here's just an example. We talked about this in the um, in the previous in lecture one. Um, suppose we had, we had a distribution of planning problems. Uh, let's say of Mars, of uh, the Martian terrain. And this gets compiled to an integer program. So this is a risk aware path planning problem. Uh, this gets compiled to an integer program. We do this learning to search uh, to learn a better uh, branching heuristic, let's say. And then at test time, if we have a new test problem from the same domain or distribution, we apply our new solver that we've learned with this learned component uh, on this new test instance, and hopefully it solves the problem faster than a conventional solver that we use to train um, this approach with this feedback. That's the basic idea. That's just to summarize the key ideas. We train a solver to solve optimization problems well. It's supervised because we can run an existing solver on this training instances and then use that training data from the existing solver to train our, train our a learned solver. And, be, and if we have a large amount of training instances, so large, many problem instances, then we can use a neural net to uh, learn this decision heuristic if we want. And so just to repeat again, a slide that we show in lecture one. Um, um, here we're measuring it in terms of the search size. Um, so the number of nodes expanded in the search tree. And, uh, and so if we put a budget of 2000, so that's, you see, you see on, the, on, the, on the title of the figure on the top, if we put a budget of 2000 search size, then what's the best solution you found after searching for 2000 states? And you see that with a learned decision heuristic, we outperform the the uh, handcrafted heuristics in these uh, existing solvers. And the x-axis is the number of integer variables going from 400 to 560. Uh, any questions? Okay, so just an aside, you know, we talked, I, I talked very briefly in the beginning of lecture about graph neural networks. Um, you know, we can also, uh, you know, people also use all, all sorts of features. So uh, here are two papers, one in the, the links are on the bottom left and the middle right, that actually talk about ways of doing featureization. And so, you know, um, people have studied learning for in integer programs for a long time, and people have come up with all sorts of uh, features that you can use to help predict these decision heuristics. And you can just see some of those um, uh, on the left. And again, you can, also, you can also just look at the structure of the integer program and convert that to a graph where the vertices are the variables and the, uh, or sorry, where you, it, you convert it to a bipartite graph where, um, where on, the, on one side you have the variables and the other side you have the constraints. And variables are connected to a constraint if it appears in a constraint. So that's it, that you see on the on the on the top right. So this is one way of converting uh, the integer program into a graph representation. Then you apply a graph neural network to it. And I and I think that in practice, if you want to get the best performance, you do you sort of combine these both these ideas. You use these all these handcrafted features that you can feed to a neural net, and you could also um, uh, convert the integer program into a graph neural network and then and then train a graph neural network to learn our implicit representation and then basically perhaps concatenate the two and studying something like this could actually be interesting uh, as a project for this class you know understanding how to best combine these feature representations for example any questions on that Okay, so I think the last thing we'll cover um, is again something that we, we, we talked about in the first lecture, but I wanted to revisit it in the context of everything we've talked about today, which is, um, you know, everything we've talked about today um, basically iteratively builds up a partial solution until we get to a 
to get to a, a full solution. There are other approaches that start with a full solution and then just do like uh, swapping or local update modifications of local uh, full solutions until it reaches a full solution that's, that's as good as possible, ideally optimal. And there's a few different versions of this approach. There's message passing approaches and there's neighborhood search approaches. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna talk about neighborhood search approaches. And one of the reasons why you, we want, there's a few reasons why we want, might wanna do this. Um, and this is something that we, um, we, we talked about in the, in the first lecture as well, but I just wanna reiterate it here. One thing that you'll notice um, 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 in terms of all the things that we talked about in this lecture so far is that it's is time or efficiency of the search problem is measured in number of states visited. So do we visit, do we have to visit like a thousand states before we found the optimal solution? Do we have to visit like 10,000 states? What was not mentioned is how much time it took to run, to run the local decision heuristic to make a decision about what state to visit. So for example, if, it, if the neural net somehow it is, is, a, is a thousand times slower to, to actually make a prediction than a simple heuristic, because in neural net you have to actually in, in the worst case, you may, you may have to like put the data to a GPU, so which means you have, to, you have to transfer data to a GPU, run the GPU, uh, run the neural net on the GPU, and then pass solution back to the to the to the CPU. I mean that whole that can take you know anywhere from like uh, you know a, a millisecond to maybe even half a second, depending on how complicated the problem the neural net is. I you know. Um, and if your local search, if your local decision heuristic is lightning fast, it takes like a, just 0 0.01 milliseconds or 0 0.001 milliseconds, then even if it expands like you know 100 times more of the state space, in terms of total running time, it might be way faster. So the existing solvers in, that people have implemented can be very fast. And one of the things that was maybe not uh, mentioned uh, so explicitly is that in all the experiments that were described, in the majority of the experiments that were, that were described in this lecture up until now, if you actually compare running time rather than size of the state space explored as the measurement of efficiency, then actually the existing solvers, even though they explore more of the state space, they're typically often faster in terms of wall clock time if, that, if you use wall clock time to measure efficiency. So there's this trade-off of you know, training a large neural net to make these good local decisions, but then having those large neural net take a long time to run before making a decision versus having a cheap but more naive local decision heuristic that you know, ends up, you end up exploring more states before finding the optimal solution, but each decision is made super, super quickly in such that that's still worth it. And so one, one, one way to sort of get the best of both worlds is to use the existing solvers as subroutines. And so that's what we're gonna do here. We're going to um, basically use the existing solvers as subroutines and the way we help out the solver is we tell the solver what variables to focus on. So for example, we can either predict which variables are hard, that's paradigm one in this slide. And that's called, uh, for example, one common thing is called a backdoor variable. So we basically tell the solver, set the backdoor variables first, and then we'll, run, we'll use the generic solver on the back on the rest of the variables. Paradigm two is predict the decomposition. So we, 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 we break up the problem into smaller problems, and we run the solver on these smaller problems. And that's the large neighborhood search paradigm. And that's the one we'll just revisit in the context of everything we've talked about in this lecture. So we have a bunch of integer variables, we partition energy variables into a complete partitioning. And then we um, freeze all the variables except one partition at a time. And then we run the solver on that partition. So for example, we could partition the variables into, uh, into, 10, into, into 10 partitions. So each, so the solver is, is now running on 10% of the variables at a time. And then we repeat this step until, we, until some time limit or convergence criteria is met. So the basic idea is, well, we, we want to, the learning, learning here happens, or we want to use learning to predict the partitioning. After we predict the partitioning, we just run the existing solver, which uh, can be very fast in terms of wall clock time. 
and it should be even faster on these smaller problems. So the benefits of this approach is that it can leverage state-of-the-art solvers and their implementations and can be competitive in wall clock time, which is harder to do with the previous approaches um, uh, because of implementation details often. Um, the drawback is, is relying on an existing solver being good for these subproblems, and is relying on being able to find those subproblems. Um, and so here's some empirical results where um, basically you do a bunch of random partitions. So it's like a, we take something like a reinforcement learning approach um, where we uh, randomly uh, generate partitionings and we run the solver on those partitionings and we, we look at how well the solution quality is and we use that to train, train a model that predicts partitionings. That's the basic idea. Um, and uh, you can look at the figure on the far right. I think this is, that's probably the most interesting one. So basically, um, Groovy is a, is a state-of-the-art commercial integer program solver. And it's used as a subroutine here. So we, 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 we chop up the, pro the integer variables into small partitions. We predict how, to, how, the, how, how that partitioning is. is. And then we, we loop over the partitions in the partitioning. We run Groovy on the smaller problems. We compare that with um, running a Groovy on the full problem. And one thing you notice here is that this approach is a thousand times faster than Groovy on the full problem in wall clock time, which is, you know, uh, it was actually unexpected. So this is quite interesting. So this is just preliminary work. Um, so this is a work by the, one of the TAs, Jalen. And so if you're interested in following up on this, on this type of work, uh, which I think is very interesting, um, you know, you can talk to Jalen for some project ideas. Any questions? Okay. Oh, yeah, I forgot. And <laughs> one last thing. This, I'll, I'll make this very quick. Satisfiability. Um, I'll go over this very quickly. Um, the details don't matter so much. Uh, what you see here is, um, is what's called SMT, um, which is a theorem proving uh, formulation for theorem proving. And you want to ask the question, you know, given this clause, which can have both Booleans and reals and integers and all other things, you know, can, we, can we find a satisfying uh, grounding of the variables to satisfy this clause? If we only use Booleans, then SMT reduces the SAT. This is often used for theorem proving. So the idea is, can we find a satisfying, can, if, can we find a, a, setting, a, a setting of the variables that satisfies this clause, yes or no? And we do that using SMT solver. And this is the, what the action space looks like. Um, um, you can do various forms of manipulation of the clauses to make to reduce the to reduce the complexity of the clauses until you can make a decision. Some of the some of the action spaces look like just re, uh, reformulation of the problems. Some of them will start to look like things like branch and bound, where you free, freeze one of the variables and then you find some sort of admissible heuristic on the on the on the branch. And you know the the, the learning algorithm is based on imitation learning. Um, you, you try a bunch of ways of solving the problem and you look at how well they do and then you, you, you use imitation learning to learn on that supervised signal. And so here's just an empirical result. Um, again, you know, this is, uh, you know, I, I realize the SMT um, uh, stuff is probably quite foreign to most people in this, in this class, but maybe a few people are interested. And if you're interested, you can follow up on this paper and linked here for details. Um, but this is uh, actually quite impressive in my opinion. Um, these are uh, Approve and Sage 2 are um, two in industry benchmarks for SMT solvers used for verification. So SMT solvers are used for software verification for like, for like proving that a uh, piece of software is bug free, which is very important for safety critical applications. For example, the flight controller on your aircraft needs to be verified to be bug free. And so on these two industry settings, industry uh, SMT benchmarks, Sage 2 and Approve, 
you see that this synthesized strategy that uses learning to learn this uh, decision heuristic for how to reduce and branch uh, on this, uh, uh, make this re reduction in branching decisions in the solver is a thousand times faster than a handcrafted state-of-the-art SMT solver. And so uh, to me, I, know, I thought this was very interesting. So you can also use these things for things, uh, these ideas for things like theorem proving, which is what this is about. Uh, any questions? Okay, so the next the lectures for the next two weeks uh, are as follows. So I should just mention that um, this lecture basically rounds out the, the, the core lectures, the four core lectures, which should give you enough ideas to start thinking about which papers you want to read in detail, what you want to do for the blog post, what, where, where you want to pursue for your research project. So that's, this is the last of the four core lectures. Uh, the, the next few lectures will take various, uh, for the remainder of the class, will take various formats where we perhaps go deeper into a special topic. I might get some guest lectures to talk about their research. And then and for, the, for the next two lectures specifically for next week, we're going to do a deeper dive into reinforcement learning and imitation learning as it applies to learning to search. So some of the issues that we talked about today that I didn't go into technical details of, I'll, I'll, I'll go into technical details of them in next Tuesday. And then next Thursday, I'll talk about advanced Bayesian optimization settings that have been used um, both here at Caltech and, and at other institutions where we were able to use Bayesian optimization to do interesting engineering design. Okay, that's the end of the lecture.